We all know that you can't believe everything you read, but at the same time, most journalists do try their level best to get the facts straight. It requires checking, and wherever possible, a first-hand account of what's happening. But an eyewitness account is not always possible, particularly in nasty wars on the other side of the world. And so reporters sometimes have to rely on other people's accounts. The story then becomes as good as its source, and sources sometimes lie. The U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, deals in information and misinformation. Tonight we see how the CIA has been able to plant news reports that aren't just inaccurate, but totally fabricated. This is Angola, a former Portuguese colony in southwest Africa that's been at war since the mid-70s. Its left-wing government, supported by Cuban soldiers, fights a continual battle against guerrillas backed by South Africa. Ten years ago, the Soviets helped send guns and troops here, and the United States responded with support for the guerrillas. According to newspapers at the time, that's how the Angolan War started. But did it? John Stockwell, wearing the cross, worked for the CIA for 12 years. As a colonel, his last assignment was to run the U.S. campaign in Angola. The basic theme was to make it look like a, a Russian-Cuban aggression in Angola. And so any kind of story that you could write and get into the media anywhere that, that pushed that line, you did. Uh, one third of my staff in this task force was covert action, was propagandist, whose professional career jobs was making up stories and finding ways to get them into the press. In 1975, the resource-rich African country was being fought over by three factions. Agostino Neto led the left-wing MPLA, which eventually became the government. Jonas Savimbi, an anti-Marxist, led UNITA, which was openly supported by South Africa. And another anti-communist force was led by Holden Roberto, who had been paid by the CIA for 14 years and was now to receive major U.S. support. The CIA had just closed down three long-term paramilitary operations in Southeast Asia, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. They'd had over a thousand paramilitary case officers come flocking back to Washington. They didn't have desks for everybody, much less jobs, and morale was rock bottom low. They wanted a covert action. They wanted a paramilitary encounter. The rationale uh, was that uh, uh, the Soviet Union was trying to take advantage of the United States' weakness right after the, the Vietnam War, that Angola was getting its independence and they were trying to snap it up. And that Henry Kissinger decided that we could not be weak and we wouldn't let them do it. Our own files disproved that. We moved into Angola first and the Russians were responding to us. But before the CIA could move, the U.S. National Security Council had to be sold and Stockwell helped with the briefing. The first briefings on Angola literally went, gentlemen, this is a map of Africa. Here is Angola. And then they went on with a chart to explain there are three liberation movements in Angola. One of them is headed by Holden Roberto. He's the good guy. We've worked with him for years, and they use literally good guy. Then the, the MPLA is headed by this drunken, psychotic Marxist poet, Augustino Neto. He's the bad guy and they used exactly the so to make sure that people understood. <laughs> Once the National Security Council had given its blessing, Stockwell and the CIA cranked up their propaganda machine, and newspapers around the world became unwitting accomplices in the campaign. From the CIA's headquarters, Stockwell sent his propagandists to Britain, Portugal, Zambia, and Zaire. Far from the battlefield in Angola, they wrote news releases for the two Western-backed factions, and these were fed into the ticker tapes of the Western media. Stockwell's CIA man also wined and dined Western journalists and gave them personal briefings. His man in Zambia was particularly enthusiastic. He ran a story that the city of Malangi had been captured by the UNITA forces, and in doing so, it captured 20 Russian advisors and uh, they thought this would show that Russians were running the thing in Angola. There weren't Russian advisors. It wasn't a factor, and we knew that. But the story did well. 
the Toronto Star, like many newspapers, picked it up from Reuters news agency. It was also carried in the Montreal Gazette and in the Vancouver Sun. I, I remember reporting that very clearly. Fred Berglund was the Reuters reporter who filed the story from but, Zambia. Um, y years later, I discovered that um, a little CIA um, misinformation expert had sat in the um, U.S. Embassy in Lusaka and had composed that communique, and it bore absolutely no relationship at all to truth. You've got to remember, at that stage, during a war, um, you're working under incredible pressure. I, I worked for four months without a day off for 16 hours a day. And all that was wanted was a flow of information. I mean, I, I'd done the same in the Middle East War. I, uh, I was based in Damascus. I mean, in the first week of the war in Damascus, I, I wiped out the Israeli Air Force three times over with official statements. Reuters, with its headquarters here on London's Fleet Street, is one of the world's largest news agencies. Its international bureaus provide many newspapers with their only source of news from far parts of the globe. Well, I mean, with hindsight, um, some of the official statements from the side I was reporting, and I stress from the side I was reporting, but also from the side that people in, um, in Luanda with the MPLA were reporting, clearly most of those, rep those statements were completely false. The CIA man in Zambia soon came up with an even better story. He had some Cuban soldiers uh, raping some young Angolan girls. Uh, then there was a battle and he had uh, that Cuban unit cut off and captured. And then he had the Cuban women, the victims, identifying their rapists. And then there was a trial and they were convicted. And then he had them executed by a firing squad of the women who had supposedly been violated with photographs of, of, of young African women with uh, weapons shooting down these Cubans. Uh, there had never been a rape. There had never been the military action. The Cubans had never been captured. Uh, it was all fiction. Fiction, maybe. But it showed up on the front page of papers like the Toronto Star. The Toronto Globe and Mail also ran the story, and its headline attributed it to Angolan guerrillas. Many other Canadian newspapers in cities like Winnipeg, Montreal, and Halifax picked up the story. Basically, and to put it very crudely, you can um, publish any old crap you like, and it will get, um, get a newspaper room. But despite the best efforts of the CIA, the armies it supported didn't stand much of a chance once Cuban soldiers showed up. The force led by the man who'd been on the CIA payroll, Holden Roberto, was wiped out. And UNITA and the South Africans made a hasty retreat. Back in Washington, Congress didn't want another Vietnam and voted against spending any more money in Angola. More recently, the CIA has found work for its skilled writers in Central America particularly in the campaign against the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. First, the arms flow story. According to President Reagan, Nicaragua supplied guns to left-wing guerrillas in neighboring El Salvador. The Sandinista dictatorship of Nicaragua, with full Cuban-Soviet bloc support, not only persecutes its people, the church, and denies a free press, but arms and provides bases for communist terrorists attacking neighboring states. David McMichael was the CIA's senior analyst on Nicaragua. He was asked to write a report on the arms flow, but when he looked at the evidence, it didn't support Reagan's claims. The, the argument that we're dealing with here is, do these arms come through or from Nicaragua with the complicity of the Nicaraguan government? And the evidence does not sustain that. In 1981, the CIA asked McMichael for a report on the Nicaraguan press, opposition, and church. And uh, my, my conclusion was that, uh, you know, there was a significant space for these, uh, for these groups to operate, uh, but that they were in no, in no danger of suppression or disappearance. Compared to any other Central American country, Nicaragua has by far the liveliest uh, opposition press and media over two-thirds, for example, of the 40-odd radio stations in the country are, are still privately owned and generally speak their mind. When McMichael spoke his mind, the CIA didn't like it. He was fired. 
But after four years of fighting, now the Nicaraguan government has suspended many freedoms. In the world's newsrooms, the CIA efforts at disinformation continue to turn up. In 1982, reporters were shown photographs of what the CIA said were Soviet bases in Nicaragua, identifiable by their Soviet-styled obstacle courses, training areas, and guns. I used to laugh and say, look at that Soviet-style baseball diamond over there, you know. Um, you know, this is, this is almost foolish, really, you know, to talk about this. First of all, they're not Soviet military bases, that's, that's the whole point. The second is that a barracks is a barracks, you know, an obstacle course is an obstacle course. The Soviet freighter Bakuriani pulled into the Nicaraguan port of Corinto today, carrying a mystery cargo which could lead to a showdown between the Sandinista Just government... Just over a year ago, Ronald on the Reagan. day President Reagan was re-elected, his administration came up with another Nicaragua story. This one had to do with Soviet MiG fighters, which Washington said had been shipped to Nicaragua in some mysterious crates detected by satellite surveillance. The result was more headlines. But as the story developed, doubts began to emerge. Ronald Reagan had a warning today for Nicaragua and for the Soviet Union. Reagan said the U.S. still cannot confirm reports that Nicaragua has received a shipment of MiG-21 jets. But he said if the reports turn out to be true, the U.S. would take a very dim view. The Nicaraguan government has denied that crates taken off a Soviet freighter today contain any warplanes. And it's accused Reagan of trying to whip up an invasion fever. By week's end, U.S. officials were saying there weren't any MiGs after all. It's the usual thing. The charge makes the headlines. The retraction makes the inside pages. Eight or ten days later, it's revealed, well, MiGs weren't on the way, but that's no longer a headline. So what one is left with is the overall impression from the screaming headlines of the week earlier that Nicaragua continues to represent this enormous danger to the security of the United States. This nation of three million impoverished souls, half of whom are under the age of 15, you know. Well, I would, I, I would say people are very silly if they believe everything that newspapers tell them. And I think pro probably anybody who buys a newspaper needs a course on how to read newspapers.